Hello, everybody. Thank you very much, Magda, for the introduction. <clears throat> Once again, I'd like to thank uh, the Judaic Studies Program at Fordham and the university for giving me the opportunity to make these lectures, and especially to Professor Petter. Today, our subject is well-behaved women undermining Jewish gender. The first three lectures, I spoke about the gender border and the gender hierarchy. The last lecture, we talked about how the gender border was moved and how the hierarchy was challenged. This lecture and the next, I'm going to concentrate on two women who themselves challenged both the border and the hierarchy, each in her own way. In 1976, Laurel Thatcher Ulrich published an article, the first sentence of which was, well-behaved women seldom make history. Ironically enough, the article itself was about well-behaved Puritan women and how important they were in history, even being traditional and conventional. However, that phrase, well-behaved women seldom make history, became a meme of its own. So tonight, I'm going to talk about two women, one very ill-behaved and one very well-behaved, but two women who I think had a lot in common. So the first is Mary Wollstonecraft, lived from 1759 to 1797, very famous as one of the mothers of feminist philosophy. She was certainly not a well-behaved woman. She had a child out of wedlock, a second one almost out of wedlock. She was a supporter of the French Revolution. And then when she went to France, she joined the Girondist party, which of course uh, was the party that lost to the Jacobins. And at one point her life was in danger. Uh, she had a very eventful life. She also was a prolific author. She wrote novels, treatises, uh, children's book. So uh, although she died at a, the young age of 38, she was extremely productive and to this day famous. Her most famous book is called A Vindication of the Rights of Woman, in which she laid out her program for women gaining what we would call equality, but she didn't call it that. And she is known as a radical utopianist. In other words, she was trying to argue for a utopia where men and women were on the same footing. Now, she's always, uh, many often thought about as a radical. However, in recent years, people have shown how she wasn't perhaps as radical as her reputation. And I would like to focus on one aspect which shows that she was uh, certainly trying to please her audience or get her audience on her side. About 70 years ago, Leo Strauss of the University of Chicago put out a very influential book called Persecution and the Art of Writing. And the basic thesis of this book is that when people write under conditions of persecution, under fear of being censored or worse, they write in a particular way, which he called esoteric writing, esoteric writing. What is esoteric writing? The gradual replacement of the accepted opinions by the truth or an approximation of the truth, but it has to be gradual. The replacement of the accepted opinions could not be gradual if it were not accompanied by a provisional acceptance of the accepted opinions the replacement of the accepted opinions could not be gradual if it were not accompanied by the suggestion of opinions which, while pointing to the truth, do not fragrantly contradict the accepted opinion.
Wollstonecraft, in the Vindication of the Rights of Women, posited several axioms. First of all, women are disposed to act rationally. Many people thought women were not rational in the 18th century. Now, in order to act rationally, they have to be taught, they have to have knowledge. And indeed, while Stonecraft insisted that women can apprehend the same knowledge as men can. Therefore, women can be educated and must be educated in order for them to act rationally. And in marriage, a woman should be a partner, not a maid. Now, in order to argue for these theses, we resorted, at least in part, to esoteric writing. For example, she wrote, connected with men as daughters, wives, and mothers, their moral character may be estimated by their manner of fulfilling those simple duties. So here, Wollstonecraft is granting the provisional truth that women should be defined by the relationship to men, daughters, wives, mothers. But their moral character depends on how well they fulfill these roles. The end, the grand end of their exertions of fulfilling these roles should be to unfold their own faculties so here she's pointing to the truth. Women should be allowed to come into their own and acquire the dignity of conscious, she doesn't say equality, but virtue. The goal is that women should acquire virtue. But then again, she is careful not to offend her audience. Let it not be concluded that I wish to invert the order of things, I have already granted that from the constitution of their bodies, men seem to be designed by providence to attain a greater degree of virtue. So we still have a gender hierarchy. Men are more virtuous than women, more virtuous than women will ever be. And for the moment, he's claiming that she's not trying to upset that hierarchy. I then would fain convince reasonable men to emancipate their companion, to make her a help me. So she's talking to reasonable men, to people who think rationally. And again, she's assuring them she still wants women to be help meets. Would men but generously snap our chains and be content with rational fellowship instead of slavish obedience, they would find us, that is women, more observant daughters, more affectionate sisters, more faithful wives, more reasonable mothers. Now, no chauvinist pig could disagree with this. Of course, any man in the 18th century and maybe later would have to agree that women should attain these improvements. But having lulled her audience into complacency by the provisional acceptance of these conventional truths, then she pulls the trigger. Women might certainly study the art of healing and be physicians, as well as nurses and midwifery. Well, okay, the allied health professions, women already were midwives and being a doctor or a nurse uh, is in line with the nurturing character that women are supposed to have, but that's not enough. Decency seems to a lot to women. They might also study politics 
business of various kinds they might likewise pursue. So here she is finally doing more than just pointing to the truth. She's stating what she thinks the truth is, that women should indeed go into all fields, including those very male fields of politics and business. Now our second woman is an 18th century Jew who could have been Mary Wollstonecraft's grandmother. Her name, we don't have a picture of course, her name was Sarah Rivka Rachel Leah Horwitz. She was probably born sometime in the second decade of the 18th century and died in the 1780s or very early 1790s. What we have here is a copy of the first page of a booklet which she wrote. If Mary Wollstonecraft in 38 years wrote uh, more than 10 books from, uh, we call her Leah Horwitz, by the way, she's always known as Leah Horwitz. Leah only wrote this one little pamphlet, which is eight pages long, and where Mary was a, an unconventional woman, Leah Horwitz was very conventional, very well behaved. She was the daughter, sister, and wife of rabbis, actually the wife of two rabbis, not simultaneously, but she was surrounded by learned Jewish men and she herself was much, much more learned than uh, any woman would have been at her time. And she was, her learning was legendary even in the 19th century, long after she had died, people spoke of how learned she was, how intelligent she was. This pamphlet has three sections in three languages. First, there is a Hebrew introduction, a kind of apologia explaining why it is that she is writing this tefina. A tefina is a prayer in Yiddish, many times aimed at women. This particular tefina is going to be for women to recite in the synagogue on Shabbat Navarchin, on the Shabbat before the new moon, before Rosh Chodesh, when the new moon is blessed, he is writing a tzachina that when the men are saying the prayer for blessing the new moon, the women will be able to say her tzachina. So in the introduction, she explains why this is necessary and desirable. And obviously the introduction is aimed at the rabbis, the learned men who could understand Hebrew. The second language, the third section of the pamphlet is the Yiddish Tchina, which talks about the importance of Rosh Kodesh and prayers for what we want for the new moon and for redemption. In the middle, there is an Aramaic poem, which is basically parallel to the Yiddish Pina, paragraph for paragraph, it talks about the same things, but it's in Aramaic. Why Aramaic? Well, I think it is really Leah trying to get legitimacy. Not only did she write her Hebrew introduction, but she wrote a prayer in Aramaic the learned language of the Jews. Most men in the 18th century could not read and understand, let alone write in Aramaic. And here, this woman, she can do it. You might recall last week, we, we talked about Rivka Tichtener and how the man who printed her book was amazed that a woman had such learning and could quote from sources. So, Leah is trying to gain legitimacy by saying, look, I can do it too. Now, like Mary Wollstonecraft, Leah Horvitz 
It's talking to rational people, he says. Surely, the legitimacy of women's prayer does not escape any clear-eyed person. And I will not speak to dullards. So her audience, like Mary's audience, is rational men. And she also uses, in, at least to some extent, esoteric writing. And here's an example of it. In the Aramaic poem, in the Aramaic prayer, she says, we pray to you a prayer that you will grant us and to all sages of the scholarly fellowship, male children, scholars of Torah, like Moses, the faithful shepherd. So she voices what is a very traditional, conventional prayer. People pray for boys and that boys should be like a man. Who's the ideal man? Moses. Now in Yiddish, in the parallel passage, she does something else. In the Aramaic, she accepted provisionally the conventional truth. Boys are preferable to girls because they can be scholars. In the Yiddish, which of course would be read by the women, she says, we call you our beloved father and ask that you grant us and all who apply themselves to your holy Torah, that we should merit having proper and healthy offspring. And the word in Hebrew is zera, which literally means seed, our seed, our offspring. So in the Aramaic, she asks for benin duchrin, for male issue, male children. But in the Yiddish, she asks for the gender neutral offspring. In other words, I think what she's saying is there should be more women like me, women who are learned in Torah. Now, like Mary, Leah is very aware of the stereotypes and appears to accept them. For example, she says, women are talkative, gossiping in the synagogue on the Sabbath. Women cry. Women talking rather than praying in the synagogue arouse jealousy, even in such an awesome place. When she gets home, a woman argues with her husband over finery. She says, in the synagogue, I should be outfitted, outfitted as beautifully as so-and-so. And here we have pictures. These portraits were painted in 1781 in Poland of two Jewish women. This is the mother, Heike Lewowski, and this is her daughter, Elia Lewowski. So it gives you an, ex an idea of what it means to have finery that you might wear to the synagogue. But given, at least provisionally, these stereotypes, Leah then launches into her real argument. Rav Asa's maxim is well known. In the Talmud, Rav Asa says, it is only by the merit of women that the generations are redeemed. Women are responsible for bringing the redemption. Well, Leah says, this is placing. placing the permanent residence that is men in Aramaic, Yitziva, down on the ground, and the strangers, women, in the highest heaven, you are reversing the gender hierarchy. Women bring redemption, it should be the men who bring the redemption. In his own home, even a weaver is a satrap. A man's home is his castle. The man rules the home. So how can it be that it's the women who bring redemption? 
Moreover, a proper woman obeys her husband. We all know that. It's in the Midrash. So what is this? <laughs> Women bring the redemption? How can that be? So now Leah latches on to that statement. It is only by the merit of women that the generations are redeemed. And she uses it to issue a challenge to her readers to reconsider women's status and role in Judaism. And there are three things that she wants women to participate in much more than they do. The pictures I'm about to show you are not from the 18th century. First of all, women should learn Torah. Secondly, women should participate in the public worship service in the synagogue. And finally, women <clears throat> should be recognized as being obligated to obey almost all of the commandments. The picture you see here is from a religious Zionist uh, website discussing the degree to which women are commanded to serve in the army as men are. These pictures indicate that what Leah was proposing in the 18th century really did not come to fruition until the late 20th century. But let's talk about what she exactly was advocating. She knew that there was opposition. She knew that there was an antithesis to what she was proposing. As we saw in the first lecture, the Talmud says, How do women gain merit by bringing their sons to the synagogue to learn Torah <clears throat> and by sending their husbands to the study hall and waiting for them until they come from the study hall? In other words, women's job is to facilitate the religious cultural fulfillment of men. Women are to be the facilitators, men the performers or actors. Second, as we saw already, everyone believed a proper woman obeys her husband. There is a hierarchy in the marriage. The husband has hegemony in the marriage. And thirdly, one of the most famous rabbis who ever lived, Rabbi Shlomo Ephraim Lunschitz, who lived in uh, Poland and in Prague, who's famous for having written the Kli Yakar, one of the important commentaries on the Bible. And he authored several other books as well. He says the following, it is well known that the male is obligated to perform many mitzvot, commandments, not through a females who are exempt from most mitzvot. Well, maybe this is well known, but it's not correct. It is not correct that women are exempt from most mitzvot, and Leah is going to focus on that. We've spoken several times about the three special mitzvot of women, so-called special mitzvot of women, that is lighting candles Friday night, everything involved with the female biological cycle, and separating a portion of the dough when baking challah. So first, Leah addresses this idea that a proper woman obeys her husband. And she says, yes, that's true. In all matters of this world, a man should act manly and be a man. Even a lowly weaver is the state trap in his own home. Okay, men, I'll give you this world. But in matters of the world to come, women should prevail over their husbands. In other words, a woman doesn't always have to obey her husband. 
There are times when she shouldn't obey her husband. You recall last week, Rivka Tichtener said, men and women should obey each other. So she gives an example of when a wife should disobey her husband, or more than disobey, give him an order. If a husband wants to neglect Torah study or have his sons neglect it, then blessed is the wife who prevails over him and brings her sons to the synagogue and waits for her husband to come from the Beit Midrash. So the conventional wisdom that a woman obeys her husband has been challenged, perhaps even undermined by Leah. Now this is a citation that we've seen in a previous lecture. It comes from the Shulchan Aruch, who was written by Rabbi Moshe Israelis, the rabbi of Krakow in the 16th century, known as Ramu or Rama. He's talking about the Birkat Mazon, the grace after meals, and the introduction to the grace after meals. Optionally, women may form a grace quorum for themselves. You need at least three people to recite the introduction to the grace. Three people is the minimum quorum. And so if you have three men, you have a quorum of men. You have three women, you have a quorum of women. But when the women eat with men, they are obligated and they fulfill our, their obligation through our quorum. And we spoke about the significance of his saying our. Today, I wanna to focus on the last phrase. <clears throat> Even though they do not understand. Now, several times we've spoken about the Mishnah, which says that Nashim Meha'aretz, women and uneducated men, do not have to understand the Megillah, the book of Esther, when it's read on Purim. They just have to listen to it. They don't have to understand it. There's no need for them to understand it. In the Middle Ages, Rashi and other uh, authorities had a different idea. It's important for women and uneducated men to uh, know what Judaism is all about. They should be able to understand the Torah and all of Judaism. But you see here, still in the 16th century, there are people who are telling us, number one, many if not most women didn't understand. And number two, they don't have to understand. It's not necessary for them to understand. <clears throat> so Leah's next argument is, women are entitled to engage in Torah. She says about herself, don't be surprised that I am writing a prayer to be recited in the synagogue, even though it is not often that a woman engages in Torah discourse, quote, the crown of Torah is set out for all the inhabitants of the world, and that includes women. So women have just as much of a right to deal in Torah as men do. And Mary Wollstonecraft said, ignorance is a frail base for virtue. If we want women to be virtuous, they can't be ignorant. They must be educated. Leah says something similar. Not only do women uh, have a right to know, they should know on Shabbat. They, that is women, who speak words of Torah and study, each according to his or her ability. Moreover, those men incapable of study and women should read in Yiddish. 
so they also will understand how to serve God. They must know how to keep the mitzvot that apply to them that God has set forth. So women have a right to know. Women need to know because they have to serve God just as men do. Next, women's participation in public prayer is legitimate and essential. So Leah says, there is proof from the Torah that women's prayer is for the sake of heaven and brings blessing upon them. God commanded the fashioning of the basin, the kior, in the tabernacle, the mishkan, from the mirrors of those assembled at the entrance to the tent of meeting, the Oel Moed. Now this verse is usually interpreted that the mirrors were the mirrors of the women who when they were slaves in Egypt, the Israelite women, after a long day of work, would still use the mirror to beautify themselves, to make themselves attractive to their husbands so that their husbands and they, who were dead tired, would be sexually aroused and have children to keep the Israelite people alive. That's the usual interpretation. But there's another interpretation that the mirrors belonged to old women who no longer had need for them because they were past sex. And they would congregate at the opening of the Oel Moed, the tent of meeting, the Mishkan, the tabernacle, and donate their mirrors. And when they congregated, they were praying. Leah gives it a twist. Those assembled were the women. She doesn't say old women. The women who would sit in the Beit Midrash. There was a Beit Midrash, according to this, next to the tent of meeting. They would sit in the Beit Midrash all day praying. So women should be praying in public. Another proof, the verse states, when God gathers Israel from the ends of the earth, this is in the book of Jeremiah, they shall come with weeping. When God redeems the, Israel, the Jewish people, they will come back to the land of Israel with weeping. Well, who cries better than women? We need women in the synagogue to cry. A person's prayer is only heard in the synagogue. Therefore, since the day of the Lord is near, that is, redemption is almost here, it is proper that our women come to the synagogue morning and evening to pray with copious tears. So even if they can't read, they don't know Hebrew, they can cry. And then she gives a practical reason. By composing this Tukhina, I believe I am benefiting the public, since in any event, women are talkative, gossiping in the synagogue on the Sabbath. Rabbis, you're constantly complaining that the women talk in school. Okay, I'm giving them something to do instead of talking. You should be thanking me for giving them a prayer to say instead of gossiping. Finally, she claims women are not only facilitators. Now, again, Mary Wollstonecraft wanted to create a utopia based on rationality, wherein women are partners and attain maximum virtue. Now, in Judaism, the way you are virtuous is by observing the commandments, the mitzvot. Leah does not mention the three so-called women's mitzvot that we spoke of, just as Rivka Tichtener did not mention them. 
for these uh, intellectual women, these three mitzvot of lighting candles, going to the mikvah, and separating the dough, these three mitzvot had no special standing. Instead, Leah argues, there are altogether 613 commandments. There are 365 negative commandments. Don't kill, don't steal, don't commit adultery. There are altogether 248 positive commandments. Do sit in the sukkah, do observe the Shabbat. However, according to the Rambam Maimonides, since the temple was destroyed, there are only 60, 60, 60 positive commandments that still apply to individuals. So men have to observe 365 negative commandments, 60 positive commandments, altogether 425 commandments. Well, what about women? Do they have three commandments? As we have mentioned, women are, are exempt from positive commandments that have to be performed at a certain time, such as wearing tzitzit or making a blessing on the lulav or hearing the shofar, etc. <clears throat> Leah tells us that of the 60 positive commandments, only 14 are time linked. That means women have to observe 365 negative commandments, 46 positive commandments for a total of 411 commandments. Well, 425, 411, you can't say that women are just facilitators. <clears throat> women have a fulfilling religious life. They have religious commitments. So Leah wanted to increase women's cultural capital. They should study Torah. They should participate in public prayer. And they should observe many, many mitzvot. To compare Mary Wollstonecraft and Leah Horvitz, Mary said women, <clears throat> women require formal education. Women can apprehend the same knowledge as men. Leah said women should study Torah. Mary said women are disposed to act rationally, be partners and attain maximum virtue. Leah said women should participate in public worship and observe a full complement of meets both. Mary said, in marriage, a woman should be a partner. Leah said, in matters of the world to come, women should prevail over their husbands. More than partnership, sometimes the woman is the boss. Thank you very much. I want to begin by thanking Professor Tetzer, uh, Professor Katan Rivets, and the Fordham Jewish Studies Program for inviting me to participate and by expressing my gratitude to Professor Rossman for this thought provoking series. I want to pose a few questions in my response to your talk today, Moshe. And in many ways, they include not just a reflection on this specific talk, but also on what we have heard over the past weeks. As you noted at the beginning of your talk tonight, the title of this talk in the next, Well-Behaved Women, comes from Laurel Thatcher Ulrich a historian of early modern United States book. She stated, or article, she stated, well-behaved women seldom make history. You have said, well-behaved women undermine Jewish gender. All the Jewish women we have seen thus far, including Leah Horowitz, the topic of your talk tonight, were quite well-behaved, certainly in comparison to Mary Wollstonecraft. Leah undermined gender despite this, but what about the others? Is the reason gender hierarchies are so entrenched in Jewish society and have remained so constant over time is that Jewish women were so well behaved throughout the centuries? 
How can we compare well-behaved or not well-behaved Jewish and Christian society and the marks they left on their own societies? I want to ask you to further your comparison between Mary Wollstonecraft and Leah Horowitz. When Wollstonecraft wrote her vindication for the rights of women, she knew she was doing something unheard of. Is the same true of Leah Horowitz? She may have wanted to prove herself in Aramaic when writing to the boys club, but did she see herself as doing something very daring? And does society around her see her book as such? Can you tell us more about its reception? How would you compare their impact on their surroundings? Do male authors quote Leah's book? Who read it? Was her trina said by other women? Returning to your talk, I would sadly comment that there was another similarity between Mary and Leah. Both women were similarly almost completely ignored or at the very least sidelined until the mid 20th century feminist revolution in historiography. So I am asking you, what kind of history did each make in her own time? Tonight we heard, as you noted, an example of two her stories the story of two outstanding exceptional individuals. One of the issues feminist history has grappled with since its outset is how to account for the multitude of women who did not write or leave a record in some other way. You built your first talk in this series around Joan Scott's seminal Gender and the Politics of History article. But the essay she wrote in the 80s, right before she published the Gender and the Politics of History, Gender and the useful as a useful category of historical analysis essay in the American Historical Review was one about women's history. She argued that it was imperative to move away from the her story model that you use tonight. Gender as an analytical category helps reveal social structures of power and control. It is socially constructed and can only be studied and understood in its specific cultural context and in relation to more than single examples. I want to ask you now to move away from the her story model, perhaps in a different way than Scott intended. Do you think Leah Horowitz, not in her writing and her learning, but in her opinions, beliefs and activities was such an exception? Were there others around her who shared her activities and norms? After all, she quotes well-known Talmudic maxims and she praised the matriarchs on Rosh Chodesh, just like so many Jewish women had done over the centuries. Biographies of Wollstonecraft mention her friends. What do we know of women in her circle? You may say that question is unanswerable because no other writing survived, but I want to suggest that it is possible to see other kinds of documentation, not of Horowitz specifically, but of other women who are contemporaries. Let me provide an example from the medieval period with which I am more familiar. You have mentioned the figure of Dolce of Worms, who died in Worms in 1196 a number of times in your lectures. For the audience that is unfamiliar with her, I will briefly say that Dolce was married to an important rabbi, Elazar Worms, author of Sefer Rokerach, and was a successful businesswoman and a very active and pious community member. She went to, day, she went to shul twice a day in the days when there was no frau in shul. She prayed in the main sanctuary alongside the men with the women of her community, led other women in prayer, and organized many communal activities, including candle making for ritual purposes, preparing the dead for burial, brides for their weddings, but also making tzitzit, migilot, tfilin, and sewing sifrei Torah. She was not a facilitator, or not only a facilitator, she was an active participant. Dolce, unlike Leah Horowitz, did not leave a written record. We know about her because she was killed when her house was attacked by two marked men looking for money. After this tragic event, her husband wrote a poem commemorating her and her activities. Put differently, if she had not died in such tragic circumstances, we may have thought that no woman as active and involved in the community could have existed. For many years, scholars saw her as an exception. She was a member of an elite learned family, married to a rabbi like Leah Horowitz, and is described as especially active and influential. Yet over the past years in my work and in the work of my students, we have found many other active businesswomen who paid more taxes than some of their male counterparts. We have found women who appeared regularly in courts and on bills of sales, some of them married, some of them widows. Epitaphs and tombstones have revealed 
multiple medieval women who are commemorated as going to synagogue twice a day and performing commandments. In short, in Dolce's day, there were many who prayed in public every day, went to synagogue every day, performed commandments every day. So I wonder how exceptional Leah Horowitz really was, or if the serendipity or coincidence of history make us think she was more exceptional than she was. I am asking you if there were many Leahs, but they just didn't write an eight page booklet. Finally, I want to bring you back to a question that was posed in a slightly different way last week by Professor Karlebach. You have argued that during the early modern period, Jewish women began to find their voice and move from facilitators to the position of historical participants and actors. I confess that as a medievalist, and the example I just brought of Dolce and her peers can serve as one example, I do not share this view. But if I were to continue with you along the path you have formulated so beautifully for us, I want to ask you to further elucidate what you think during this period made this change possible. Why did this happen in the early modern period and not before? Thank you. Moshe, you are muted. <laughs> well, thank you very much for this thoughtful response. Let me start from the end. Uh, I think I was careful to say that these things did not begin because I knew that you were going to say something like this. <laughs> Medievalists always say to the early modernists, oh, we have that, oh, we have that. <laughs> so it's not a question of beginning, but it's a question of saying how in this period, the conventions were challenged. Doesn't mean it was the first time they were challenged, but as I tried to say uh, last week, you can see from the sources that there's contestation going on that there's struggle going on, there's conflict about these things. I tried not to say that there was no conflict before. There was, so that, that's that. Uh, now, why do we have so many ill-behaved non-Jewish women and at least apparently only the well-behaved Jewish women who uh, challenge what's going on. I think a lot of it has to do with the place of Jews in society. That uh, as long as someone is within the community, they are relatively protected. As soon as they rebel against the community, if the community expels them or, or uh, disapproves of them, then they are exposed to uh, the larger society, and uh, often the response was, if you don't want to be part of the Jewish community, if you don't want to obey the Jewish community, fine. You only have one choice, be a Christian. So I think that is a very powerful uh, reinforcement of people behaving. Now, impact. So what you have said about the medieval period that you found many more people like Dulce. Well, yes, in the early modern period, I can also show you people, uh, women going to court, women doing business, women paying taxes. It's, it's very evident. Uh, the question that I'm raising is how many women mounted an explicit challenge to uh, the gender boundary and the gender hierarchy. Uh, very, very few women could have been as well educated as Leah and Leah herself. It's obvious never had a formal education. She didn't go to the yeshiva. And we know this because of her, the way she quotes sources. Uh, she was largely I don't know, self-taught, probably taught by her father, her brothers, her husband, and by herself, she studied. 
Uh, but if there was one Leia, I'm sure there were 10. Just as if there were one Glickle, I'm sure there were 20. My great dream is to discover the Polish Glickle who wrote her memoirs in Yiddish. I'm sure she exists. I'm sure more than one exists. We just have to find her or them. But Leia had, from what we can see, virtually <clears throat> no impact in her time. How do we know this? Well, her Tafina in Yiddish was reprinted many times. It was only reprinted with the introduction where she lays out her arguments once. Once it was uh, translated into Yiddish. So we could say one and a half times it was reprinted. And that's it. So obviously it was suppressed. Nobody wanted, uh, not nobody, the rabbis didn't want to pay attention to it. On the other hand, the fact that there is an audience for women saying, you know, in the synagogue tells you that A, there were people who didn't want them there. And B, there were many women who wanted to be there. And as we discussed last time with the synagogue architecture, it becomes more and more friendly to a women's, uh, women's presence in the synagogue. But there's opposition and it goes back and forth. I assume going back to the Middle Ages, going back and forth. So um, I think I covered all the points. Right. I don't know, Elisheva, what do you have further comments on the response? I mean, I just would, I, I realized and I heard you say very clearly that it didn't begin in the early modern period. And of course, every historian likes to say that in their period, this big change happened. I think that's one of the things we all know from our work. And that probably means we're all wrong. In other words, we do have a continuum over time. And there's some in the Middle Ages and even before the Middle Ages. Let's go back to Sarit's response a few weeks ago, but I still would like to um, maybe try to ask you, what is so unique about the early modern period? I'm asking this as a medievalist, looking at you from behind or from before and asking, so what happens here that people like Leah Horowitz write this? Is it print? Is it the ability to get educated? I mean, what is happening here? So that's one point I would make and kind of throw that back at you. I understand the point you're making. Oh, okay. What is special about the early modern period? Let me what just... is special is printing. That oh. is the, the basic difference. Because of printing, so people who could not be educated before now can be. Uh, we spoke about last week about the new Yiddish library, which is accessible to women as well as Amarasim, uneducated men. And that makes a tremendous difference. And not only for Jews, of course, <laughs> also for Protestantism owes a lot to printing as well. So because people can read for themselves or listen to other people reading to them, they can think for themselves. They start thinking new thoughts <laughs> and why not? So, uh, the short answer, I think, is printing. And, and printing is uh, it's already a cliche to say, uh, has as much effect in the 16th and 17th centuries as the computer did in our own lifetime. And the other thing I would want to maybe question or problematize a little bit is I would not say she had no impact because the introduction was not reprinted. If there are many women who are saying this prayer, I would say that's impact. And I would wonder if there might be a number of different ways of looking at what impact means or change means is if we have more women on the ground um, going to the synagogue than she did and saying this specific trina, even if it is a continuation of what was being done before. And I think that throughout the Middle Ages and the early modern period, women would say trinot to Sarah Rivka, Rachel and Leah, like she um, presents us in her trina. Um, I would say this is an impact that leads to change. So um, I, would, I would perhaps uh, push back against what you said, that she had no impact. Her introduction might have had no impact, but the women saying these prayers would have had an impact. So I'm asking you how you see the impact 
from there if we had to kind of um, trace out what's happening? Or do we just go till the 20th century to the mid 60s or whatever? No, no, not at all. You know, last week I, I was criticized for having a, uh, let's call it Whiggish interpretation of uh, progress, the line of progress, the straight, uh, not two, uh, two weeks ago with uh, Deborah Kaplan. A straight line progress. Uh, and now you're saying, well, gee, <laughs> was, it, was it nothing happening? No, of course not. I think you see this struggle, this conflict, this contest going on for the next 400 years with ebb and flow. So if we're talking about the 19th century, I would also discuss the whole question of seating in the synagogue and uh, the liturgy. I mean, again, you can see women and some men pushing for greater participation, for a higher cultural capital for women and people resisting that all the way through to our own day. But uh, I specifically showed those 21st century pictures to give the idea that the same issues that Leah and I assume other women at the time were grappling with uh, are still issues today. So I will jump in because there are some really uh, great questions from the audience that tie into your discussion. And uh, so one, uh, one series of questions is about how did uh, Leah Horowitz win Aramaic and uh, were there at the time um, women who, can, who could read and understand that, that prayer in Aramaic? And to what degree did women take up her challenge? Who did she think she was writing for? Were men included, you know, did they read the, their, her tinas uh, uh, who published the, 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 the pamphlets? So I guess, again, the sort of broadening that uh, horizon that Arisheva was also asking about, who else was behind, uh, you know, that book publishing, reading, uh, intended audience? Okay, the book was published by a woman, Yehudit Rosanis, hmm. who had her own print shop in Lvov. Uh, Lvov, Lvov, I'm not sure which politically, politically At this time, politically I think correct, it was Lvov. <laughs> uh, you, you read Rosanis, and that's how we know when, when it was printed. It was printed uh, in the 1780s. Uh, so I think it's likely that she had an interest in publishing this. She probably agreed with what Leah, Leah was saying. Uh, the audience, it's clear that the audience for the introduction in Hebrew is the rabbis, where she's justifying her doing this. The audience for the Hina, she says, is the women. She says, I'm giving them something to say. Uh, we have one other source or Leia, uh, another autobiography that we have from the 18th century is by Bear of Bolochov, Dov Bear of Bolochov, who was a, a wine merchant who was born in 1723. And he tells us that when he was 12 years old in 1735, he lived in the town of Bolechov, and every Shabbat he would go to the rabbi and the rabbi would give him a portion of Talmud to prepare. And the rabbi said, okay, I'm going to take my nap. When I wake up, I will test you on it. So he went to take his nap and Bear says he really couldn't study it on his own independently Talmud. Because most men couldn't study Talmud on their own. But as luck would have it, the rabbi's sister was sitting there. And who was she but Sarah, Rivka, Rachel, Leah, Horvitz. And she is the one who actually would teach him. And then when her brother came, he would be the star pupil. So uh, the way the education worked in the early modern period, uh, very few men would be able to 
understand Aramaic without a teacher. They certainly could not have written Aramaic. I don't know how many women did know it, but uh, it's obvious that the, small, the number was infinitesimal. Uh, with the men, we're talking about less than 10%. With the women, it can't even be 1%. So uh, your answer to a certainly uh, fascinating uh, fact that the booklet was the book was published by a woman uh, that is that is something very special and well, I want see, to compare this to Rivka Tichtener, who had a man publisher right. and he had to give a justification right public you didn't his honest didn't have to give any justification. Yeah, so this is uh, actually ties nicely again to some of the, the questions, but that little uh, allows me to, to jump into that question. Are there any relevant changes in the economic situation of Jews in the places where Jewish women were finding a voice? Um, so, oh, well, okay, so this is the question that we're talking about. What's the economy in Ashkenaz? Because that's what we've been talking about. So there's Western Ashkenaz and Eastern Ashkenaz, uh, Germany, Poland, Lithuania. Uh, it's a, I, can, I can't answer it on one foot. I mean, it's a very complicated question. Throughout the, eight, the, the, the three centuries, we're talking about 16th, 17th, 18th, uh, things changed so much. The only thing I will say is, this is a period where it's much easier to travel and there's much improved communication because of the political boundaries. It's possible to send uh, messages, even what we might call mail. Uh, and because there's more possibilities of inter what we would call international uh, commerce and business. So there are more opportunities. More opportunities means women also and get a piece of the action. And next week, we're going to talk about a woman who had a big piece of the action, and that's Glickle. So I think we have uh, time for a couple more questions. And related to the question of change, uh, there's a question, what is the significance of Leah Horowitz uh, that she believed in the day of the Lord is near? How did the belief impact uh, her conclusion, radical, uh, conclusions radical for her time? Believe in the imminent and can motivate new ideas, stringent or otherwise. All right, I think that was just a cliche. Uh, Jews always believed, <laughs> traditional Jews, that uh, the day of the Lord is near. Uh, she was just, again, accepting the conventional opinion I don't think that she, uh, you know, the stories of the teachers who would sit in Europe with uh, a flask of milk and honey on their desk. So the students would ask, why do you have a flask of milk and honey on your desk? And they would say, because when the Mashiach, when the Messiah comes, I want to be able to give it to him right away. So this is a faith that, uh, the redemption is uh, on the threshold. So uh, a question, uh, uh, Elisheva, for you. What, when did women begin to serve in Hebra Kadisha? Um, whether you have records of, for that and was it as much a source of prestige for them as it was for men? I think uh, it's a very good question. I think Dolce is an example of a woman who prepares the dead. So she certainly is serving a kind of Hevra Kadisha, but we have to ask two questions here or make two comments here. One is that there certainly were women before her. In other words, people had died throughout the centuries and there were always people who prepared them for death. And one can assume that women took care of women like men took care of men. And that this went along with the traditional understanding of what the proper way to take care of bodies of the different sexes was. Um, I think that the other part of the question is when was there a chivra kadisha? Mm -hmm. And that means when was there an institution or an organization or a group of people that were considered the ones who were supposed to do this? Um, at least in medieval Ashkenaz, we don't have evidence of a chivra. We don't have evidence of an organization like that. That is an early modern phenomena. 
And Moshe, you can see that I'm now saying here, we have something that didn't begin in the Middle Ages. We see it only later. So I am certainly accepting um, being a guest in an early modern forum to tonight uh, for you and for Magda, I'm saying this, but I do think that forming organizations of this sort, which is really an early or a late medieval, I won't give it only to the early modernists, but is a late medieval, early modern um, occurrence is something that perhaps is um, a, a factor to take into consideration when we think about these issues that have to do with gender. And I would say uh, the same way we have guilds forming, the same way we have chevrot forming, it would be interesting to think about how that impacts on gender upholding conventions or undermining them. And I think that would be a really interesting way um, to pursue this. This is one of the reasons I kind of hinted to Mary Wollstonecraft's friends. And I said, who were Leah Horowitz's friends? Because here we could see how a circle of people could really make that happen. So I don't know who her friends were. The only person I know that she had anything to do with was Dov Bear Volokhov, who was uh, a few years younger than she. Uh, in the early modern period, we have Kavarot Kadisha, but they're sort of a women's auxiliary. They're not full members of the Hevra itself. I presume many of them are the wives of the members of the Hevra because it was prestigious. I have found one woman in Poland in the 18th century who is listed as a member of the Hevra Kadisha. And since there's only one woman, so it's not that all the women that had to do with it are in the Hevra. It may be that she was the head of the woman's auxiliary and uh, they decided it was important for her to be at the meetings. And I think that's our final question um, related to uh, the 18th century and the enlightenment as we all know, or many of us know, a big, a, a big debate um, erupted around the question of secular education during the Haskalah and the Enlightenment uh, among European Jews, especially German, uh, German Jews. So what were the attitudes to of uh, the uh, secular regimes or, uh, towards education of Jewish women at the end of the 18th century? Um, and those members of, uh, that is France, Prussia, and uh, Austria, Russia, and those of the members of the Haskalah movement. I don't know whether we can just briefly answer this, this is a big question, but. Well, just like the Yiddish library developed to some extent, uh, as, as we said, because women, there was a need to educate women and uneducated men, lest they be influenced by the non-Jewish literature that was being published. So uh, you needed a, a culture literature. Well, what Shmuel Feiner showed was that in the uh, late 18th century when the Haskalah starts, uh, the masculine felt that their women had to be educated to a certain extent. They couldn't, uh, have to, that they themselves, the men, uh, are so worldly and knowledgeable and they come home to somebody saying it's Venus. So they wanted their women, their wives, their daughters to have uh, a worldly education. Although as we'll see, there were also men for other reasons and as early as the 16th, 17th century who wanted their women folk to be educated, but that was for other reasons. And Alicia will probably say even in the medieval period as well. <laughs> so on that note, uh, thank you so much. I want to thank both of you and I'm always delighted to have uh, a medieval voice in the early modern room. Uh, so thank you Alicia for joining us. Thank you Masha again for, for a great talk. And I invite you all for our last um, uh, uh, installment of this series next Wednesday at the same time and uh, our the respondent will be Professor Ruth von Bernath. So uh, thank you again and uh, I'll look forward to seeing you and, uh, and uh, next week. Thank you. <laughs>